Hi guys, um, this is going to be part of the AC videos, but it's kind of a special video. Um, I've got, I've been watching and talking to some people that's having some troubles with uh, resonant circuits, tune circuits, and I thought, well, it'd be a good time, even though we haven't actually went through the inductors yet, which we will. Uh, the next video on AC will be going all the way through inductors. In fact, it may be a two-part. There's a little more information there on inductors than there were on capacitors. But in any case, we will be. So uh, some of this may seem uh, a little foreign um, in in some regards because we have not went over inductors. But <clears throat> I thought I'd just go ahead and do this uh, real quick. But uh, before we do that we're going to do a little math but I'm going to be the one doing it you don't have to uh, memorize this or anything but it will kind of explain uh, uh, in the math actually will kind of explain some things uh, first of all I have shown this formula before and you'll find it um, where if you want to know the resonant frequency it equals 1 over 2 pi square root of L and C. Now the L is inductor and C is capacitor and frequency will be in Hertz, uh, inductance will be in Henry's, capacitance will be in uh, farads. So where does that formula come from? Well, first of all, let's do a look at a real rough graph. Um, we take a graph, be frequency down here, and this over here will be um, x sub L and x sub C. Both. Um, not that we're adding them together, but it's just the homage. And if we look at this graph and we plot x sub c, since it's a 1 over formula, um, well, resonance is too, but it kind of comes down something like this. But if we plot x sub l, it's linear. So it goes up something like this. Now it can change a little bit, but depending on the size inductor, and same with the X sub C. This point right here is your resonant frequency, RF. Where the two cross, where in other words, where X sub L in ohms equals X sub C in ohms is where the resonant frequency is. So what that means is that X sub L equals X sub C the inductive reactance equals the inductive capacitance at resonant frequency. So from that I can uh, write out the two formulas. So X sub L is 2 pi F L and that equals my X sub C which is Induct or capacitive reactance, which is 2 pi uh, Fc. Now, from that, we want to we want the frequency. So we're going to solve for frequency. So we're going to do some algebra to solve for frequency. I'm going to multiply both sides by frequency because I want to get rid of it on this side and ha have it just on the one side. So I multiply by frequency and the nice thing about equations you can multiply one side by something as long as you do it to the other side they stay equal. It matters not what you do. I mean I can multiply both sides by 100 it's still equal a million, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. Well, 
on this side the F's or frequency will cancel because it's just frequency over frequency which equals 1. On this side we'll have 2 pi F squared L. This will be over 1 2 pi C. Now it's squared because F times F is squared or frequency times frequency. Now we're going to get rid of the 2 pi so I got to divide both sides by 2 pi so to do that I'll just multiply by 1 over 2 pi same thing as dividing okay. here they cancel because 2 pi over 2 pi again is 1 so they cancel out that leaves me f squared L over here it's 1 over 4 pi squared C. Now I want to get rid of L on this side. So again I divide by L. We'll just divide by L which is 1 over L. Both sides we have to do both sides so 1 over L over here. Here they cancel because L over L is 1 so we have f squared equals um, 1 over 4 pi squared L C. Well that's fine but I want the f to be just by itself. I don't want f squared. So now I got to square root both sides. So I square root I left myself enough room to get this in there now little properties of square rooting and stuff let me wrote this down is this is also square root of 1 over the square root of 4 pi squared L C that is the same thing as that because since it's a a, a simple fraction then I can put the square root split it up so it's square root of 1 over the square root of the numerator here but I can take that more because this is all multiplied together that turns out to be the same thing as this square root of 1 in my numerator square root of 4 pi squared times the square root of L C. And that is the same thing as that, which is the same thing as this. So now we'll come down here. The square root of uh, frequency squared, that just all cancels out and gives me just frequency. You know, it's just like if I plugged in here, if I take 2 squared I get 4, I take square root of it I get 2, well I could actually put a 2 in place of this so 2 squared which is 4 and the square root is 2 or I can just leave it as 2 and just cancel out the square versus square root. This square root of 1 is 1 because 1 times itself which would be squared is 1 you know, 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 always will be 1. So any root I take of it is always going to be 1. This here, square root of 4 is 2. The square root of pi squared is just pi. So I get 2 pi. And then I just got this left over. And we'll just leave it as a square root because I don't have any numbers for it. To know for sure what it's going to be. And that is exactly that right there. And that's how we get it. Again, you don't have to know this. It's not important. The biggest thing is to realize I start out with my inductive reactance formulas. One for capacitance and one for inductance. When I make those two equal, then I come up 
breaking down to this formula, resonance frequency. So what does this got to do with what we're going to do the video about? Well, first of all, we got to explain a couple things. Y'all seen, you have all seen uh, where that formula was used, that resonance frequency, mostly in a tank circuit. Comes out here, we have a capacitance, an inductor in, in parallel, and then we'll just feed off from that to whatever we're hooking up. It could be an oscillator, it can be any number of things. It could be an antenna coil, RF tuning coil, in the uh, RF amp section, if it's got a radio's got that. It can be any any number. Uh, most most radios will have a variable capacitance will be your tuning capacitor because we're going to look at the resonance circuits that's in the front end of the radio and your tuning condenser you know it'll be two or three sections depending on whether you got a tuned RF amp uh, before the uh, mixer tube or not so that's what you normally see that's parallel re uh, resonance but you can also have this which is series resonant circuit again the connections can go to wherever it can be an oscillator it can be uh, antenna coil or RF coil up in the antenna section with a tuned condenser or um, you know the tuned RF amp. This could be in its plate circuit. Uh, but it doesn't matter. And these produce exactly the same thing. A band pass res at a resonant frequency. So if you graphed it out you would see something um, with frequency here and you know gain. We'll just put G here. And it would come out something like this. And the band pass would vary a little bit depending on the Q of the circuit, which we'll get into when I talk about inductors and stuff. But in any case, it's going to come out something like that where it peaks at the resonant frequency. Now, either one with parallel series will produce this. So, now we're going to get into talking about a little bit of troubleshooting and what can go wrong with these circuits. So, circuit number one, just a schematic, and let me kind of come down here a little bit and see if I can zoom in on this. Um, Now, this is just a, a radio, it's a two band radio. We have broadcast and shortwave. I believe shortwave runs from 6 to 16 megacycles, and then the broadcast uh, around about 550 or so up to into the lower end of what they called the police band, uh, about 1730 or so. Now, your antenna hooks up in here. We have antenna and ground, and then we have a band switch here. Real simple switch. Uh, these two coils are the antenna coils or RF coils. They're uh, for tuning that part of the circuit. And this one is the broadcast. It's a short wave. The switch is in short wave band. Here is the two oscillator coils. Um, I believe this one here would be shortwave and then that's broadcast. They just there's no tuned RF in the front end. They just feed directly into the mixer oscillator 
the antenna wheel from its tune circuit and then we go through the IF. Now, when you're dealing with circuits like this, they're pretty simple and really the primary um, things that's going on here besides the tube, and the tube is part of it, but is the coil or the coils and the tuning condenser and any trimmer can, uh, caps patterns that may be in the circuit for trimming for doing alignment. Now the tuning condenser, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, you know just like any tuning condenser on any radio. Uh, uh, it has air dielectric. In other words, it's in the air. There's no actual insulation between the plates. Some of the things can go wrong with it. Um, they can get the plates can get bent so that when you actually start closing it or, uh, it can end up shorting and of course you lose your signal you know either the oscillator will shut down depending on which section it is that's doing this or the you know you just literally short out your antenna coming in that circuit another thing is dirt that's in there or something like that 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 is conductive that can short uh, the other thing that can happen to them um, is uh, they can actually, the rotor part needs to be grounded or at least connected to the B minus circuitry in some way or uh, the ground circuitry of the uh, ground of the circuitry of the radio. And that can uh, get really dirty and corroded so that it's not uh, making good contact. Uh, there would be some fingers or, or a bent piece of brass that springs against the, the rotor shaft. And what will happen is you generally will have the radio will make a lot of popping and crackling noise as you turn the tuning condenser or uh, turn the dial, but you won't be picking anything up when you stop at any place. And that's usually just a bad ground. It's not a whole lot can go wrong with them. So if they're not shorted, the wires are connected up to them, and the ground's good, then they should be a, a pretty decent operation. But what about the coils? Well, the coils can be shorted, for one thing. You can have a shorted coil, which will throw the frequency way off. Um, there's not a lot of windings on these coils. Uh, the broadcast band will have a lot more than, say, the... Uh, say a shortwave band but still there's not a huge number of coils on them and they you can get a few windings short in there and that can be enough just to throw it off frequency basically all you need to do to throw it off frequency is um, if I can find it on here there we go is we've got to go outside this frequency here that's all we gotta do we just gotta be off roughly about this or even about half this and that's enough that it'll throw the thing off so it don't it don't want to operate properly. Uh, you may pick up signals, but they'll be highly attenuated. Remember that the band pass on this is appears something like this. Um, well, that doesn't help. So we'll go out. So your band pass is like this. It's resonant here, but as you and that resonance will move as you tune the radio but if you're off frequency some and say this is the IF and you're off down in here then it's drastically reduced in signal strength it may with a strong radio stations you'll still pick up you'll still hear them but they won't uh, sound that good and they'll be quite weak so because they're down here where it's really badly attenuated um, they can even be down in here, which there's still some signal there, but it'd be extremely weak and it's going to have to be a very strong signal to get there. So, you can have a shorted winding. And that's one thing. The other thing is, is you're dealing with, on these radios, you're dealing with something that, that's got some age to it. It's probably been worked on and messed with by 
maybe several different people. Another thing can happen is if they had a bad coil, you know, the coil was open for some reason, and they decide, decided to rewind it, they may not got the right number of windings back on there. Maybe they lost count, or, or maybe they just didn't realize it's that important and they just made it kind of look good, or any number of things of that nature. So they can either be low on number, high on number, which will throw the frequency off. The other thing can happen too, uh, especially in something like this where it's a transformer, we're feeding into the primary and then picking up off the secondary, they can actually um, wind them the wrong direction. Uh, just for sake of argument, if, I, if, if this was a coil form right here, and say looking from the bottom, the original ones was wound clockwise from the bottom going up, and they got confused and wound it just the opposite counterclockwise. Well, then it might work on an antenna coil, um, but it'll be reduced in strength considerably, but it, it may still work. Uh, but the thing is, it's not going to have, uh, the transformer is not going to work quite white because it's, it's attenuating the signal down because they're not in phase. The primary and secondary isn't. The simple way, if, if that's what you end up determining, is just flip your connections on, on, the, on that suspected coil. And that will fix that. As far as the number of windings and the difference is that, there, that one is a little more difficult. First of all, easy determination is not the easiest thing to do. For one thing, the schematic may not even have much information and a lot of them don't about coils. Sometimes you'll be lucky enough they'll tell you um, some resistances, DC resistance. It's a coil wire so it's got some DC resistance. But some of these they don't have to be that many wind, uh, that far off. Especially like in shortwave coils don't have to be, you know, it can be one turn can throw it off considerably but the DC resistance of just one turn off is not going to be that much difference because you're probably looking at like 0 0.5, 0 0.7 ohms or even 0.1 ohm um, barely a vegetable uh, resistance there you, you take one turn out you're not going to notice any difference not with standard uh, ohm meters so it makes it real difficult to actually truly know for sure what's going on now if it's visually something that you can actually see great then you can work on it but there is another way a lot of these are pretty easy to, to deal with especially antenna coils if you got a good signal generator which you should have if you're going to be doing a lot of work on radios for uh, for doing alignment well with a, a signal generator uh, say on this radio here for example say that I was concerned about the shortwave coil being off something's wrong with it it's not either on frequency or, or something screwed up I can tie my signal generator at the antenna here put the hot lead there leave the coil in place I want it connected to the tuning condenser so I'll just connect to ground this goes to chassis so I'll just connect my ground lead off my uh, signal generator right to the chassis. So now I got my signal generator hooked to the primary. What about how am I going to know what it's doing? Well, uh, I'll use my oscilloscope. This goes through the switch, through the tuning, and goes up here to uh, this grid on the tube. All I would do is uh, on the 6 SA70 7 I don't have a grid cap uh, the grids underneath on the socket just pull the tube out find the pin number for that pin from your tube manual and that will be where I hook my scope to the so I would hook my scope there its ground would go to chassis you know, hook this this part to that pin. You can hook it underneath the radio, but that's where I'd hook the scope, and then of course ground, 
to ground and then start feeding the signal in. Now, the short wave in this radio was like 6 to 16 megacycles. The first thing I would do is I would just see if um, that I can tune those. I wouldn't care at this point too much about the dial other than if the low end 6 megacycles then I would want the, to turn the tuning knob down or where the condenser is almost closed, the low frequency in, and see and feed a um, 6 megacycles into this. See where it peaks out at. If it's peaking out pretty close to that 6 megacycles on the dial, that's good. That's fine. It's a little bit off. It's no big deal. Then I try it at the higher end and see if, I, if it's working. It runs up to like 16 megacycles or somewhere close to that. So then I would uh, check it there. Signal generator, 16 megacycles, and rotate the knob until I get to the that's shown on the dial or close to it and watching my scope and see if it peaks. Now in, in between those or when I'm not on that frequency, it should drop off fairly quickly. You should only peak it at those frequencies or pretty close. Uh, the, again, the dial could be off a little bit, so don't be too concerned if it's, you know, you're trying for 16 and you're getting 15.8 megacycles that's peaking at. Now, the other thing then is I take it to, this, if those don't seem to drive out too good or look real good, then I would take it somewhere in the mid dial range. Uh, set my signal generator somewhere between 6 and 16 megacycles on this and turn the dial until I get a peak and see where that peak's at or if it will peak and see where it's at and see how far off it may be from there. Uh, you can check both the dial or you can get it where it looks like it's got a peak and then adjust the uh, your signal generator going back and forth either side. Uh, the other thing too is on a simple just simple tune circuit like this it should be fairly close in level you know amplitude uh, from the low end to the high end. It, there may be a, some deviation it may be that it may want to work a little better towards the mid band and then kinda drop off a little bit at each end that's fine. Uh, the one last little thing is don't overpower it. Keep your signal generator at, at a, a very low setting uh, that you can still get a reading. But the thing is you're going to be comparing that to your dial and it the dial is telling you you know how much far the capacitor is open or not and that's also then telling the local oscillator what frequency to be on. So if there's a problem in this coil, it's not going to be very close to that dial. Or if it doesn't even peak at all. The coil could be fully open, which you could check with uh, an ohmmeter for continuity. Or it could be so bad and so out, far out of whack that it's nowhere near in that range of 16 to 6 or 6 to 16 megacycles. It could be clear down low, clear above. But in any case, you can use your signal generator and locate the darn thing and see if it's either on the money or it's way off. Again, always be the assumption knowing that your dial itself, your needle, could be off a little. That's perfectly okay. As long as you can get those ranges in there that, that, that the radio is supposed to receive, then you should be okay. Uh, as far as dial and all that stuff and getting it set and everything else, that's all just simple alignment. That's on that radio. Now, and, and they all vary a little bit. Um, and then we're going to talk about a couple other little problems real quick after I go through this. We look at this radio. Um, probably going to have to zoom out just a little bit. Okay. Now this has got a front RF amp, tuned amp in the front end. So it's got a three gang on a three gang tuning condenser. 
Um, basically, one will tune the oscillator, which is down below here, um, right in this area. Coils. It's multi-band, but um, one gang tunes the local oscillator, another gang tunes the, the tuned RF, the plate circuit, and the other one tunes the antenna or the input. Now, some things that that you can, you know, again, you know, the tune, tuning condenser, as long as it's not shorted, it's got good ground, the plates don't look like they've been severely bent out of shape or, or someone went in there and cut some plates out or something. I mean, in other words, the tuning condenser looks like it's okay. Um, and it's not shorted. It's, you know, uh, no dirt in there really that can short it out. And no scraping of the plates to each other, and the ground seems to be okay um, on the rotor. Then, most likely, you know, if you're having problems, it's probably not the tuning condenser. Uh, but it can be the coils again. And again, you can run into the same number of problems on this. Any radio, you can have a radio that someone's worked on. Uh, they, they could even, as far as that goes, they had a bad coil and not knowing what they're doing they could have went to some parts radio and said well that coil kind of looks like the one that's bad in this one and plopped it in there and hooked it up and when it didn't work which it probably wouldn't because no two are going to be quite the same I mean IF frequencies can be totally different local oscillator frequencies can be different you know different windings on antenna coils the whole nine yards so um, Unless it's out of an identical make and model radio, in other words, identical radio, then most likely it may not work. So, or someone could have re tried rewinding it. Someone could have just had an open at one end of it. Maybe it opened up at just at one end, and they decided, oh, well, I take a couple windings off. That's fine. It won't hurt nothing. Any number of things can be wrong with the coil. Uh, which can cause all kinds of problems. Anywhere from you just don't receive nothing, or at least nothing that makes any sense. You're not picking anything up because the frequencies are so far off. Uh, to possibly one end of the band or the other end of the band being uh, inactive, or at least very weak. Uh, so this can be in the tuned circuits. Now, how do you trace it? This radio is more fun. The, the first one I showed you, there's not much needed for tracing. You know, check the tube, make sure it's okay. Uh, if you want to make sure that the oscillator is working fine, uh, you know, on a band that it doesn't seem to be, the radio doesn't seem to be working, well, just scope it out. Hook your oscilloscope to it and see if it's oscillating and check the frequency on it from the scope and see if the you know it's about what it should be uh, you can see if it's a you know moving adjusting as you tune the dial it's changing frequency and it's it is actually operating uh, sometimes you'll have a radio that especially with shortwave bands that the shortwave don't want to work and it could very well be the tube if the tubes getting old what will happen is in those higher frequencies, the AM band, broadcast band, it's low enough frequency, the oscillator is working all right. But you get into the uh, shortwave bands, especially high frequency ones, getting up there in the, you know, uh, 6, 7, 8, 10, 15 megacycles, it could be just a little more than it can handle. It takes a little more energy to operate at a higher frequency. So if the tube is about used up, the broadcast may work fine, but the oscillator may quit working at the uh, on the high, the shortwave band. So, you know, check the tube. You can put the scope on the oscillator, make sure it's working, and then you come back and you just do as I said, testing this because that's about all that's left to do. There, you know, if the oscillator is working and the tube seems to be okay, and especially if it's picking up on one band and not the other. 
then most likely the everything about the oscillator is working. It's getting a signal through it. It's getting to the IF and on down to you, to the audio output finally. Then that leaves you with just your has to suspect something in here. On this radio, since there's a tuned RF, then we gotta look at it a little differently. There's more stuff that can go wrong here and more areas it can be. If you're having either weak signals at a part band or entire band, um, weak or non-existent, you know, it can be the oscillator's not oscillating on that band. Again, you can check that with an oscilloscope. Another way of checking it, uh, it's easier with broadcast band, but you can do it with shortwave, is you can take another good operating radio and put it next to the chassis that you're suspect of the oscillator not working or at least wanting to check it to see if it's working and you know make sure they're both on the same band and as you if you set that radio that you're using to test the other radio with then you know you can set it at some frequency there's no that there's no radio no no uh, station comes through so a clear spot on the dial and then you can rotate the tuning condenser or rotate the dial on the radio being tested and what you're doing is you're looking for a beat beat frequency you're going to heterodyne because this local oscillator if it's working right will have enough strength that it can actually if that other radio is close enough or its antenna is close enough it will pick it up and when those two frequencies get close where you got the radio tuned at and where that lo local oscillator is coming in at then they'll start they'll make a squeal all right, that's a heterodyne squeal. We call it beat frequency, but it's not really a, it's a high frequency beat. And as it gets gets closer and closer, that will change in frequency until and and start dying down a little bit and then all of a sudden you'll find a null point. Uh, at that null point, they're on the same exact frequency. And then if you move a little bit past, then it'll start coming back in with that squeal sound that you hear. But what that's telling you is that the local oscillator is working, even without a scope. And you can actually look at the dials and, and get an idea. If you know that the dial on the radio that you're using to test or hear for this is accurate, then you can actually even check the frequency. So anyway, <clears throat> first, you know, if the say the oscillator is working. Well, then what can I do? I'm, I put a, a signal into the antenna. In other words, I hook an antenna up. I'm trying to receive radio stations. They're either extremely weak or non-existent. I mean, I know there should be something there. But, and I know the oscillator. I've already tested it. It's working. And it's on frequency. So, and maybe I've tested the tubes and they seem to be okay. Um, and maybe the other bands are working fine or at least seem to be. Well, one thing I can do is, right off the bat, I could actually hook my antenna here. Disconnect this grid cap. Since this, these got grid caps, I can connect my antenna here, right on the, the mixer tube. Now, it's not perfect, and you may get some ghost signals. You may get some um, all kinds of interference and stuff because we're not tuning anything. The only way we're actually tuning the radio at this point is with the local oscillator. And that's it. So you can get harmonics, you can get all kinds of uh, stuff that might get through. But it's good enough to see, am I picking something up? And is it reasonably strong? And if you are, now you're picking up there. And it seems to be okay. I mean, other again, there'll be a little noise. It won't be really perfect by any means. Then what you can do is you can feed, you can come back behind that. And if you go down in this area here, at this, uh, on the tuning condenser, this section here, which tunes this coil and, and a couple of these down in here, but this is the RF amplifier uh, tuning, you can feed a signal into that. Good, easy place to get to, to feed it in. What that's doing is it's taking it through this tuning circuit um, here, through this, and tuning it and then feeding it into the mixer at the grid and then of course that's header dining and getting on through. It should be a little better signal. 
should sound a little better and if it's you're getting radio stations and they're strong then okay you're all right you know from there on down everything's fine the next stage is pull the grid cap off of here off the RF amp and then feed a signal into it and when I mean feeding the signal I'm talking about just hook the antenna to it you hook your antenna to that and see if you pick up those radio stations at this point that it should amplify now remember we're floating the, the grid now so the amplifier is not going to work perfect this particular amp is self biased but it, it also is uh, partially controlled by the AVC so it's not with that grid cap off it's not getting any of that it's just getting this a uh, little bit of self biasing and it's relying on the impedance of the antenna and the circuitry and stuff or your antenna basically um, to to try to keep that grid not floating real bad but it's not going to be a perfect thing the main thing is is that it's doing better than when you hook the antenna to the antenna connection that's what you're looking for and if it is then this point from the tube down is good if it's not then you know where it's, it's in between here and here if it is working alright well as good as expected then it's down then at that point it leaves this 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 is your problem then on this you can actually do the same thing as I said on the other one it's a little more elaborate circuit because it comes down it goes uh, it's got ABC circuitry hooked to it on this side and it goes through the switch and uh, which comes back and feeds through um, the primary on this coil here and back to the antenna um, first try it you may not have to unhook anything and just try hooking uh, your signal generator into here and then uh, just hook ground to the chassis uh, and then you just pull the grid cap off and that's where uh, you hook the uh, scope to scope probe to this and then ground to chassis and again same way as on the other radio you rotate the dial see if you can get the signal generator the two to line up fairly close if they are lining up and the, and the strength's good you're looking also at the strength across the band uh, seeing if it changes drastically and, and things of this nature if the frequency is either off or it's changing in strength then you know that you've got a problem here uh, again the problem could be here or here too and you can start breaking down in that circuitry one way to test some of this is by just hooking the signal generator at the antenna input and measuring it off the grid cap here you can kind of go backwards there and that will add a little more stuff into it if this seems to work out fine and test fine then hook move the signal generator over here and see if it still tests fine but th that's how you um, can test these coils and these tuned circuits and on and various radios have various uh, different things you know different type of circuitry and stuff but in any case a lot of times you can uh, isolate it good enough that you can test it you can also uh, signal trace back or inject signals either way to finally locate where your problem is if you decide not to use um, a you know the antenna to inject signals you can use a, a signal generator with a tone on it to do it but keep it real low uh, don't don't overdrive the circuit you want to keep the 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 uh, uh, signal output from that down in uh, preferably in the millivolt, millivolts at the most like one or two millivolts and really down in the microvolts uh, just one second I'm back telephone was ringing so I had to go answer it so anyway that that's pretty much all I had to really say on this um, various different radios have various little different techniques of trying to get through it uh, trace down stuff where the problem is the biggest thing is um, just try to break it down till uh, trace it down to one point if you can but you know the these tune circuits are not hard to test no matter what kind of radio you're working on uh, some are a little easier to maybe locate and get out of the circuit 
uh, or at least a little bit out of the circuit so you can test them. But again, you can test them with a signal generator and a, and a scope. I know that a scope is not a tool that everybody has, but um, if you do have one, it, it, it helps considerably. Uh, but, you know, that's one way to check that coil to know if it is wound correctly. It don't have a short. It don't have problems like that. It wasn't rewound and, and properly done or things of this nature. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's it, one of the easiest ways to test the coil itself to see how well. It, uh, otherwise, is if you knew for sure what, what, with some math you can actually find the inductance reading what the inductance coil should be and then have an inductance meter and check it is the other way of doing that and you know but not everybody even has that so anyway that's basically um, I think all I had on this Again, we will go. We're, we're going to be going over inductors, and we'll talk about them a lot more deeply than on this. And you know, then when we get into the full AC, we'll be going over uh, resonant circuits primarily is the main things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, but I will be talking also uh, in future videos on this whole AC thing about you know uh, low pass filters, high pass filters, and and various other subjects. So. Anyway, until then, I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, thanks uh, to my new subscribers. If you like these videos, uh, I do a lot of theory videos, but I also do restorations on uh, radios and TVs. As, uh, I've got some stuff to restore, so I do videos on that as well. Troubleshooting and all various different uh, topics dealing with tube equipment and tube radios. And vintage electronics. Uh, if you do like those, if you like this video, give a big thumbs up. If you just happened on my channel and you like these type of videos, then just uh, subscribe and there'll be more on the way. And you can also look through my uh, channel and look at older videos I got on there. I got about a couple hundred videos now on there, so you can go back and look at various ones. So until next time, thanks for watching, and you guys have a, a good day, and uh, I'll see you on the next video.